everyone. Welcome to Park Street University. I'm Emily Pennington, content manager for Park Street, and I head up our educational programming. We have several videos going out this week for Global Bar Week, um, but today I'm here to introduce the panel on creating a ready to drink product. In just a few minutes, I'm going to hand it over to Matt McGinnis, our moderator for this panel. He's a partner at Big Thirst Consulting, and he has over 30 years of marketing experience in both corporate and agency roles. He's been an executive VP and managing director for Cohen and Wolf, as well as a marketing director for Dell. He's also honed his expertise uh, in the pursuit of industry certifications, including certified specialist of spirits, certified sommelier, certified specialist of wine, and level three. All right, Matt, take it away. Thank you very much, Emily. It's a pleasure to be here at Bar Convent Global Bar Week. Um, today, we're talking about ready to drink cocktails with spirit based rather than the uh, popular seltzers made with anything other than real spirits. Um, before the pandemic, RTDs were growing at a rate of about 24%, which was fantastic for the past few years. But since the pandemic, they've become incredibly popular. We have a great panel today of folks who have launched RTDs and are currently um, selling them um, from their distilleries. So Mark Schilling, who is a partner at Big Thirst Consulting, uh, Melkin um, Kazvorshian, who is a co-founder and spirits maker at Green Bar Distillery, and Erica Sagan, who is the director of communications at Cardinal Spirits. Thank you all for joining us and let's hear from each of our panelists. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Emily. Thanks to everyone who's uh, tuned in today. My name's Mark Schilling, and uh, by way of a quick quick background, I uh, I founded a distillery, Revolution Spirits, in Austin, Texas, in 2013, and then in 2018, working uh, with Uncle Billy's, we created the uh, what we believe to be the first spirit-based RTD in a can here in Texas, and then. Uh, uh, in addition to that, I just announced a few weeks ago a new consulting partnership with my friend Matt McGinnis, who's moderating here today, Big Thirst Consulting. Uh, my name is Malcolm Kazrovi, and I'm the co-founder and spirits maker at Green Bar Distillery, who, along with my wife, uh, founded the distillery 16 years ago. So, you, so we are essentially one of the grandparents of the industry on the craft side. We have a very unique perspective on the uh, whole category of spirits and now canned cocktails because we came in from the outside. We were the customers, we were trained journalists. Uh, so we came in with a lot of questions and our big question for this category that we're discussing today, canned cocktails, was how can we make something that tastes as good, if not better than what most people buy at the bar and make it available to everyone everywhere? It forced us to relearn the, uh, the industry to a large extent and invest heavily in a canning line that we hope to operate uh, in January of this year, graduating from Winnie and the mobile canning line for the last year and a half to learn the ropes and hopefully uh, make a much bigger entrance in the category in 2021 and beyond. Hi everyone, my name is Erica Sagone. I'm the Director of Communications for Cardinal Spirits. We're the craft distillery in Bloomington, Indiana. We make delicious award-winning spirits and refreshing canned cocktails. I oversee social media, media relations, copywriting, and I do some photography, so a little bit of everything. And I'm excited to speak with you guys today. Thank you, everyone. Mark, let's get started with you. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everyone. Um, what I want to talk about a little bit today is, is my own experience with creating uh, canned RTD. And Really, I'm going to talk about one, one major theme throughout this, and that is that when you decide to do this, this is a major commitment that you're making. It's not really something that you can just sort of decide to do on the side at a small scale and play around with a little bit. Everything about this is really like creating an entirely new business. It's not like a line extension. It's not like just creating a new new category or type of what you've been doing. You know, if you're familiar with the old advertisement uh, from Oldsmobile, this is not your father's Oldsmobile. Well, getting into canned RTDs is not your father's distillery either. Quick shout out to uh, Dan Farber from Osocalis for letting me borrow his old school distillery photo here. Um, if you're gonna make canned RTDs, this is probably not gonna work for you. 
three things that you really need to make uh, to think about making a major investment in. It's going to be equipment, knowledge, and time. Things that are very different from what you're accustomed to doing. My comments today are, are really assuming for the most part that you already have a traditional distillery and that this is something you're looking to add to what you're doing. But a lot of what I'm saying will apply to you if you're starting from scratch. The only place where it might not apply, at least until the last few slides, are if you're planning to outsource and have everything developed, produced, packaged, and sold through a co-packer. If that's the case, you can check your email until the end. The most important thing to think about is what equipment is, are you going to need to do this? If you have a distillery, you've got plenty of stills and, and tanks, but do you have the other things that you might need? Now, you may not need all of these. Uh, it really depends on what you're making and how you're making it. Uh, bright tanks, brew kettles. Do you need a commercial juicer? Let me tell you, they're very expensive. And if you're thinking that you're going to peel and juice cucumbers by hand 400 pounds at a time, that will get very old very quick. And you might want to consider some other options. Pasteurization, uh, you know, that's something that you probably want to strongly consider. And then uh, last but not least is a canning line. Uh, regardless of what you're going to do, uh, even a small canning line is going to set you back probably fifty to sixty thousand uh, dollars. Another option is mobile canning, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But in order to do this, you've got to make the commitment to having the proper equipment to do it right. The next thing you want to think about is knowledge and experience. You might be an experienced distiller who've, and, and you've made plenty of vodka, gin, and whiskey, you may even be an experienced bartender, but going from spirits to canned cocktails is like going from bartending to uh, becoming a food scientist. There are a lot of things that you've probably not done before, unless maybe you already have a brewery as well, that you might have to think about and learn about. Uh, for example, scaling up your products. Um, it's easy enough to make a batch cocktail, put it in a keg on a draft system, and serve it out of your tasting room. But once you've decided to put that in a can and sell it, uh, scaling changes. Are you, are you experienced and do you have what you need to do that properly? Have you thought about shelf life and stability? Um, you know, these are things that are very different from putting bourbon in a bottle. You may need, you probably will need to uh, enlist a, a lab to do some testing for you. Uh, can you do proof obscuration at your place or are you gonna have to send it out? Uh, are you gonna put a nutrition label on your can? Well, if it's spirit-based, you don't have to, but because it's kind of the standard, you're probably gonna wanna do that. That's more lab analysis, more cost, more learning, um, and in addition to that, you've got to think about your serving size. What's your ABV going to be and why? Do you know that as your ABV changes, your serving size changes? Um, how are you going to develop this into your final product? Are you familiar with carbonization? Um, you know, it's different doing it in the tap room versus uh, doing it on a larger scale. Um, diastaticus? This is something that if you are a brewer, you're probably quite familiar with. This was not something that we were familiar with. And when our cans started exploding, we had a, a really quick and hard lesson that we learned. So these are, these are things that you need to consider uh, in your knowledge and experience category. You may need to hire, hire new help or you may need to go and, and do some additional training. Time and space. You have a distillery, assume, assuming that it's uh, full of equipment already. If you're going to be bringing in new production equipment, new tanks, uh, pasteurization, do you have a place to put it already? Um, do you have the ability to expand? Uh, do you have the staff to do this? Uh, you have, you're, you're bringing an entirely new product line, which is produced, packaged, and sold in a different way. Do you have the staff time and the management time to do this without bringing in new people um, and, and a new payroll? Uh, do you have a place to keep your inventory? 
Do you have a place to keep your raw materials? You're bringing in a lot of new things that you haven't had before. Your, your distillery is going to get really small really quick uh, if you don't have room to do this. One thing I'll, I'll say that we learned the hard way is you can't just buy a couple of pallets of cans unless maybe you're using a mobile canning unit. And I'll get back to that again in a minute. But uh, cans come 30,000 to a truckload, and that's about the minimum that you can purchase. Sales and distribution is another area that's going to be different from your, your typical spirit, bottled spirit products. Have you thought about the packaging? Again, you're going from bottles to cans. You're going from a spirit-based sales channel to a product that's spirit-based but is sold much in the same way that beer is. Does your distributor understand this? Do they have experience with canned beverages? Uh, do you have the ability to shop distributors or are you already tied into one? Um, are you going to have to train them on how to sell and distribute your canned product? Um, have you thought about pricing? Canned RTDs have uh, much smaller margins than what you're typically used to working with. Cans are expensive, probably half the cost or more of your entire, entire cost. The product that you're putting in the can is probably the smallest part of that. And then the wild card, of course, is taxes, something I bet you haven't thought about. Your federal excise tax, of course, is based on proof gallons and in a four to seven percent ABV can, that's probably a not very much. But take a look at your state excise taxes. Many, if not most states, charge excise tax based on wine gallons rather than proof gallons. And in many states, you're going to be competing with sugar or malt-based beverages that are taxed like beer. As an example here in Texas, the tax on a gallon of beer is approximately 19 cents. The tax on a gallon of, of spirits is $2.40. In a can, that, uh, for a can, your tax, your, your state excise tax in Texas would be something like 23 or 24 cents compared to that, uh, the White Claw type product, which uh, at 19 cents a gallon, I couldn't even imagine. That's, that's probably not enough to even think about in, in your calculations. Um, are you going to be able to sell these cans in grocery stores, or are you in a state that limits those sales to, uh, to liquor stores? Uh, all of these are calculations that go into what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. The, the key to, to this entire uh, process is uh, volume. And if you can't get your cans in all the places they need to go, it's going to be difficult. So in summary, if you're looking at getting into RTDs, I think, you know, if you can, there's going to be challenges. Uh, again, the, the biggest, the most important things you can pay attention to are the equipment that you need and the cost of that equipment, the knowledge that you need, whether you have it or not, and whether or not you can get it. And then the time to make all this happen. Again, you probably have a core business of spirits that this is gonna take time away from. Are you prepared to do that? Are you prepared to go into this with a full major commitment to doing it and doing it right? In the end, that's really what this is about. It's a new business and a major commitment. And have you thought through from the beginning and are you prepared to do it and do it right? Should you can or should you go? That's the major question. Ready to drink cocktails or a small and growing category. They're on fire. Sales are increasing. Everyone is getting into the market. Is that right for you? It might be. It might be the thing that makes you a millionaire. Who knows? But here's the thing. Ready to drink cocktails are a small category and they're growing rapidly. Sales are increasing, the category's on fire. What that means is everybody else in the world is getting into it as well, including the big guys. And you're gonna be competing against them and they've got economies of scale that you're probably not gonna be able to match. How are you going to compete with that? There are ways to do it. And I think you'll hear about that more from Melkin in just a minute. But should you can or should you go? 
That's the question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, for that uh, question of should you can or should you go. Um, let's hear from Melkin about his experience at, at Green Bar and what they're doing with cans. That was great, Mark. Uh, we're certainly rolling the dice uh, as we speak and heading into that new business in a way for us. As I said earlier, we've been in the business for about 16 years. We make a large portfolio of organic spirits uh, with an emphasis on transparency and give back mechanism to make all of our products uh, climate positive. Up until last year, or even part of this year, we had primarily been a bartender's brand. You know, 80% of our sales had gone to restaurants, bars, hotels, where someone would make uh, a cocktail out of our, uh, you know, gin, vodka, rum, cures, whiskeys, bitters, um, and tequila. Um, and that's what taught us a lot about, you know, this category that we're entering uh, and hopefully will succeed. So I'm going to talk about three things that we learned. Each one was interesting, uh, mostly painful because we're kind of stubborn in the way we do things. So it took a, lot, a long time for each of these to really sink in. But our journey began with first working with bartenders and you know, kind of showing them, especially the, the bartenders that work in uh, more busy restaurants, but restaurants that are not staffed with mixologists, how to simplify cocktails. So a lot of our spirits are designed to remove one or two ingredients from a drink, make those drinks able to be made at a much faster pace and by, you know, maybe not the best bartenders under the sun, but, you know, just kind of normal uh, journeyman bartenders. And we thought, hey, we can take this idea of simple cocktails to the public because they also love cocktails, but they don't like making them at home because it might be too tough. So we began with teaching cocktails to, uh, to the public through point of sale displays in, in retail stores. We would put, make up these beautiful point of sale pieces where we built shelves and all of the ingredients for a cocktail, even the, you know, the, the citrus, for example, would be placed on the top shelf with a recipe that someone could take a picture of with their phone so they could come, be enticed by the beautiful image of a cocktail, pick up all the things that would be on the top shelf, take it home and make a drink with it. Uh, it was an utter disaster. And we thought, hey, what are we doing wrong? Let's bring it in-house to our tasting room and figure out, okay, what are we doing you know, that isn't really ringing true? So for the next three years, we trialed this uh, idea of, hey, let's simplify the drink and pay attention and ask questions uh, to figure out how we can extend this idea of you know, simple cocktail, simple mixology for the public. And for three years, we, we, we taught thousands of visitors how to make these simple drinks. And to my utter shock, sales to these uh, visitors versus normal tour and tasting visitors was a fraction in terms of bottle sales. And I was scratching my head thinking, there are people who come in, learn to make a drink, make at least one drink that they're really proud of. Why aren't they buying bottles and taking them home to make these drinks? And after a while, uh, you know, just talking to the visitors, one after another said the same thing. This is fun. I love drinks, I love cocktails, but it's also a lot of work. And guess what? To make my first drink, I probably have to spend 80 to $100 on a few bottles of liquor to be able to pull off that fancy drink I made at your distillery or that you're showing me on your point of sale piece. Um, and it finally dawned on us that, hey, people love to drink, they just hate to make that drink. So that was our first big lesson and our entry into canned cocktails that uh, you know, the revolution or the re-revolution that took place uh, 20 years ago to reintroduce high quality cocktails to the public through first uh, speakeasies and then mixology bars and then now pretty much any, cor any corner bar uh, stops more or less for most people at the home because they're too tired, they're too busy, they're too challenged to make those drinks at home but they still want to drink them. How can we get it to them? By making it ourselves putting them in cans and selling it to them through stores or supermarkets. Lesson two was what people want to drink and what price points that they will buy them at. Uh, before we launched our first line about a year and a half ago, which was a trio of spritz, I think Aperol spritz with, with Americanized flavors like hibiscus or ginger. 
um, we try out many, many drinks uh, to see which would work. We tried uh, other canned cocktails, we tried fresh shaken cocktails, and um, participants, hey, you know, what do you think this is worth and what would you want to pay for them? And we purposefully made some of them not the best drinks under the sun and told people that, hey, this is really affordable. And the second big lesson we learned there was uh, there's a threshold of quality that people will not reach. Uh, if it's not delicious, if it doesn't taste like something you would have at your even neighborhood bar, never mind a really great mixology bar, you're not going to drink it no matter how cheap it is. Uh, so, you know, make them great. At least that was our takeaway. These have to taste great. It has to taste like an fancy bartender made them. Otherwise, people just don't want to drink them. It's like empty calories. Why am I wasting my time? This is for enjoyment. This is for pleasure. I don't have to drink to live. This is just for fun. And it better be delicious. Otherwise, I'm not going to waste, you know, even a little bit of money or all those calories and alcohol to have a bad experience. That was the second big lesson we learned. And the third one was, how do we price these things? Now that we know that there's a threshold of quality, well, we can't, you know, make up for that um, uh, quality with no money. So uh, we learned that, hey, you know, the, the, the audience that we're reaching, these are the folks that really love cocktail you know, experiences, whether it's in a bar or, or, or a hotel, um, they're willing to pay. And from the time I started to drink, you know, almost 30 years ago, Till today, prices have gone nowhere but up. I remember when I first started to drink, six, seven dollars was premium cocktail. Now you put a 20 on the bar, you're not getting it back. Uh, and customers willingly pay more money for something that's interesting, delicious, a little surprising, although not weird. And um, you know, it better be entertaining, in other words. And our audiences, since they rejected bad drinks, um, the, the pricing had to be right. Uh, right now, pricing, unfortunately, or maybe because it's you know, early stages, is all over the board. There are things that cost you know, $9 a four pack, and more recently, prices are going towards $20 a four pack. We've priced ours somewhere in the middle, $14.99 for our alcoholic RTVs, to provide not only quality, but also some value. And because we're at a slightly bigger scale than you know, many of our peers, uh, and because we're gambling a little bit, we decided to price ours where, you know, if someone buys a four pack, uh, they can you know, feel like, oh, I got a little bit of a deal because it's great quality, tastes wonderful. It's you know, more or less what I would get at a bar, if not better sometimes, but it costs a tiny fraction of what I would have had to pay if I went to the bar to drink it. So third big lesson, this one's still kind of up for grabs. I don't really know where it's gonna go. It kind of parallels the beer market, the prices, could go even higher. Maybe we might see four packs in the 20s. Uh, but when someone is comparing their RTD canned cocktail to what they would get at a bar, it has to provide value. It has to taste as good, if not better. Uh, and we, for, for our products, we price them to a point where, you know, it could leave someone feeling like, oh, I got a deal. I got a little bit of a, of, of a treat because they're not as expensive as the higher priced ones but I'm getting something that's delicious, enjoyable, and just as good, if not better, than what I would get at the bar. This is our range, uh, current range, our golden state of cocktails. We make, as I said, three um, uh, spritz cocktails, which are the first ones we launched. Uh, we felt they were slightly seasonal, you know, kind of a summertime drink. Um, and about a year ago, we launched uh, an additional five SKUs, some high balls like the whiskey and soda, the gin and tonic, or rum and cola, and then a couple of non-alcoholic RTDs, which were a great surprise to us because they proved that um, you know, someone could buy these at, um, at you know, similar price point to normal cocktails, and they are selling as well as uh, you know, the, uh, the alcoholic ones. What makes our product different are a few things, um, three points of difference. And this is, you know, what we learned in A, working with bartenders for 16 years and making our spirits uh, essentially to solve cocktail making problems. So our big focus has always been the liquid. And uh, it starts with smell, aroma. It has to be bright and vivid. 
which all of ours have always had in terms of the spirits themselves, but we tr you know, tried hard to translate them to the cocktails. And the next two are parts where you don't typically see these, especially in the you know, things that people think of as cocktails, the, the malt base, um, you know, the, the, the white claw uh, RTDs that uh, you know, are typically mostly smell, but lack body, lack complexity, uh, and this is where I think the spirit space RTDs can really make a, make a strong showing. So we build purposefully a lot of richness and a lot of complexity in our cocktails, in our RTD cocktails, because I think that's what people really want. That's what people have been willing to pay a lot of money for in bar drinks. That kind of, wow, I'm experiencing something I've never had before. I can't make this at home. I'm willing to pay a little bit more money for it. It's that body, it's that turn on the palate where that you know, interesting beguiling smell turns into something interesting on the palate. And then it finishes clean for us because everything we make, we make with old ingredients and with organic ingredients. So there's no metallic aftertaste. There's no weird waxy, chemically you know, lingering flavor. And this is what we use to create palate memories. So all of our products from the spirits to our RTDs, we design so that when you have them, It'll be surprising. It'll be memorable, and it's something that you can't get in uh, an, an alcoholic seltzer, uh, or hopefully in not too many of our competitors because we want to win. So this is our first big point of difference: that they have to taste different. The liquid has to be exceptional, from aroma all the way through finish. The second and third points are more philosophical, uh, but increasingly they resonate with younger audiences that are gravitating toward these kinds of cocktails. They're more adventurous. They're not just, uh, hey, just pour some whiskey on my ice cube kind of drinkers. Transparency for us is full nutritional information. And we tell you, hey, how many calories, how many carbs, you know, what, what exactly are you, you know, putting in your body? And more importantly, what specific ingredients are you putting in your body? So we don't have secret ingredients. We list everything. And they're things you can pronounce because they're foods. You know, this is the, the back of our uh, hibiscus spritz and you can see everything and be able to recognize them because they're not some chemical compound. They're foods that you would normally use to make an iced tea or cook with, or, you know, make an actual drink with. And then the third part is USD organic certification. We're not sort of kind of organic, we're really organic and including the certification. So you don't have to trust us, you can just read the information and verify. And these are things that, as I said, you know, they appeal to younger drinkers that you know, want something that is not only delicious, but authentic and completely transparent uh, and, and open to them. The last part is sustainability. Uh, we take great care to you know, not only make you happy, but leave the world a little bit better off. And the core of that is, you know, we start with organic ingredients that, you know, keep our land and water clean, but also we plant trees. You know, we've been planting trees for the better part of our, our existence, 10, 12 years. We've now planted more than 800,000 trees. Uh, we generally plant one per bottle with our RTDs because they're much more affordable. Uh, we can't afford to plant one per, one per can, so we plant one per pack, 24 pack. And these are things that again, resonate with a lot of people, uh, especially the younger generation. But as our world becomes a lot tougher to live in, uh, especially with you know, being on the West Coast, forest fires, droughts, uh, and maybe on, on the East Coast, a lot of flooding, you know, we can do something. We can't do everything, but we as a little company can do something by opening options that make the world better and, and enabling our distributor partners, our retail partners, and most especially the public to be able to be part of the solution instead of part of the problem for non-participants. Now, what has this done to our business? Uh, it's quite drastic and uh, dramatic. I mean, from our beginning to two years ago, 2004 to 2018, 100% of our sales were bottles, mostly going to bartenders. Last year, when we entered the RTD category, that dropped to 75%, so 25% of our sales, this is volume, uh, or canned cocktails. This year, it's 75%. And I suspect in 2021, we'll be at somewhere between 85 and 90%. So essentially, Mark's right. You know, we have ventured into a new 
business. You know, we're not just a distillery, we're a canned cocktail company, especially if you look at what we're actually selling and what we're likely to get into more of, it's RTDs all day long. Uh, and this is the investment that we've uh, made this year. We are building out a high speed canning line and have maxed out our, our, our distillery. So we're now renting space to put packaged goods, to put finished goods in because we have no room. We've gone from having a lot of room to you know, counting every square foot so that we can fit all the equipment and all the utilities that we, we plan to use for our canned cocktails because we're quickly becoming a different kind of company, almost a different company than we started with. So in conclusion, you know, what does this mean? Um, to me, who began uh, with essentially the whole bartending revolution, RTDs are really the fruition of what the mixology renaissance is all about. It's enabling everyone to drink better, enabling everyone who loves that experience of something delicious, something complex, something interesting to have access to that anytime, anywhere they want to. Hopefully in the next six months or so, uh, our favorite bars and restaurants and hotels will be open and we can go back and say hello to our favorite bartenders and have their magic um, on our tongues. But until then, or even beyond then, uh, we have RTDs and hopefully the, you know, the craft industry will step up and deliver their dedication to quality in this new category. And uh, you know, in the US especially, since you know, uh, we began the whole cocktail revolution and we started that 20 years ago, quality is number one and uh, you know, our peers in the craft space are the most dedicated to this. So hopefully many of us will be able to make this transition and uh, you know, succeed in the category that is emerging and growing faster than anything else in, in, in the space. Thank you very much, Melkin. That was fascinating to hear the lessons learned uh, to create liquid with uh, true palate memory for the consumers. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Erica telling us about the uh, RTD cocktails from Cardinal. Erica, tell us about yours. Thanks so much. Hi, everybody. My name is Erica Sagone. I'm the Director of Communications at Cardinal Spirits. Uh, we're a craft distillery in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, there, I oversee our social media, our media relations. I do some copywriting. Uh, I do some photography, a little bit of everything. So today I'm going to talk to you about canned cocktails sort of in that realm, marketing, messaging of canned cocktails. I'm going to touch a little bit on social media, a little bit on press and design of our cans and more. Um, first, I'd like to introduce you quickly to Cardinal Spirits. So we are a craft distillery based in Bloomington, Indiana. It's a vibrant college town. Uh, we opened about five and a half years ago, and now we have around 50 employees, and that's spread across production, our tasting room, bar, and restaurant that is on site. Uh, we are closed to the public right now due to COVID. Um, our products are distributed in 12 states and D.C. All right, so what do we make? We make delicious award-winning spirits. We have about 12 core spirits and then we do um, a variety of seasonal and one-off products. We also make uh, refreshing canned cocktails. We have three varieties and we do a fair amount of contract spirits and canned cocktail work. So we started making canned cocktails in 2018. That was just two short years ago. And now they are our number one product by volume. Uh, we make three kinds. We've got a Bramble Mule and a Maui Mule, which are twists on the classic Moscow Mule. And then we've got a Vodka Soda, classic. Uh, why did we decide to launch canned cocktails? Great question. We wanted to make spirits and cocktails even more accessible. We want people to love their cocktails. And to do that, we needed to find a way for people to drink great cocktails anytime. We had to remove the barriers. Because let's face it, it's hard to bring cocktails to a party. I know, I've tried, I've showed up with a bottle of gin. It just doesn't work. Uh, it's hard to make a case uh, for making cocktails from scratch on the lake or at a picnic, camping, tailgating, all the spaces that we saw beer and wine just crushing it out of convenience. Uh, you know, even an easy highball like a vodka soda requires ice, spirits, mixer, glass. Uh, you know, that's why we put vodka soda in the can. They said it couldn't get any easier and I don't know, here we are. Uh, so this is the message that we hit the hardest. Our cans are ready when you are. So if you're, uh, you know, thinking about starting canned cocktails, uh, you might be in the same spot that we were in a few years ago. How do you go from making spirits 
that people enjoy in fancy cocktails with garnish to canned cocktails. It can be done. In both of these scenarios, this is me. I'm having a delicious cocktail that I love. On the left, I'm in Palm Springs in a fancy cocktail bar with my husband. And on the right, that's a photo of me last week with my kids, Taco Tuesday. And I love that canned cocktails just as much as I loved the cocktail on the left. So when we were making canned cocktails in the early days, we thought, how do we bridge our spirits and our cans? Uh, what we did is we took two of our most popular cocktails from our bar in our tasting room on site, and we canned those. We knew that we could be true to ourselves that way, and we knew that they were pretty much a proven hit. So of course, uh, it's important to us to use quality spirits, real fruit, and in the case of our Moscow Mule Riffs, real ginger, because that's going to give the mules that authentic kick that people expect. You know, in 2018, um, we weren't the first doing canned cocktails, but we were early. So we knew we'd have to tell people just what to do. You have to put it in your cooler. You have to enjoy it outside. Keep it cold. Drink it right from the can. It's a cocktail made with spirits and real juice. And it's just ready when you are, and that's the best part. So with this messaging, our canned cocktails opened up new markets and accounts for us. Suddenly we were appealing to caterers, event spaces, sports arenas, our cans have been available at the Indianapolis Colts Stadium, uh, at hockey arenas, and even bars and restaurants started carrying our can cocktails, even though they have their own cocktail program. Uh, in fact, our number one and number two on-premise accounts for our can cocktails are axe throwing places on the East Coast. So if you see that bottom center picture there, uh, that's an axe throwing places. So uh, with these cans, we've cracked into places where beer has been dominant, and that feels awesome. Uh, social media, that's the top way that we communicate and engage with our customers. Uh, we make it rewarding to follow us by sharing recipes, product announcements, behind the scenes content, and lots of reposting from our fans. So that's what you're looking at here. This is what our fans are posting about us. With our spirits, people shared what they were making at home. Look at that top row, beautiful cocktails. Here's what we'd see, pretty cocktails, but no cardinal spirits, all right? Now look at the bottom row, completely different story. Not only are our cans fun to post, but our fans are now our brand ambassadors, effortlessly helping tell our story and sharing images of our cans. All right, so here's even more social media posts. All those posts we used to see of people adventuring with beer, now canned cocktails were in on the fun and it's awesome to see. In fact, I asked our graphic designer if he designed these specifically to be Instagrammable and he said that really wasn't the intent. The idea was for them to be recognizable from across the room or store or stadium. But when he landed on this color scheme, the bursts of color translated well to social media. The clean design also reflects what's inside. The cans aren't busy or overly designed and neither is the cocktail inside. So don't design your cans for Instagram, but know that your social fans can help you do your social marketing. I also want to touch a little bit on earned media. Media pitching is something that we work really hard at. Our cans have been featured nationally in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Saver, Midwest Living, New York Post, and more. And none of these placements were luck. Um, they are based on aggressive pitching, uh, journalism, re journalist uh, relationships. Um, in none of these cases did someone just stumble upon our cans. Um, so I would suggest this as a tactic for you as well. Be generous with your samples, know your message, pitch continuously, and not just seasonally, even if your product seems seasonal. You want to maintain a mix of local, regional, and national media. One New York Times story is unlikely to launch your brand. You have to go for the steady drum drumbeat of local, regional, and national media. Lastly, I wanted to leave you with a sneak peek of our can design update. The cans on the bottom are the new design that's going to be released in the next couple of months. It's not a huge change, but I thought it would be fun to share. Um, so we're bringing some consistency to this, the design um, by keeping a red triangle um, on the face of each of the cans. And we are adding a gold top to our cans, again, just to make the experience even more enjoyable. We really want you to love your cocktail. Well, thanks so much for your time on behalf of Cardinal Spirits. Please get in touch if I can answer any other questions and please follow Cardinal Spirits on social media. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Erica. That was really cool to hear about your story. Um, so we've gone through three different segments, hearing about some of the challenges you might encounter to start up, some of the lessons learned in uh, launching new RTDs, and then some of the successes that uh, we can see in the market. Um, we started off by talking about market growth. Uh, just two years ago, projections were that RTDs, spirit-based RTDs, would reach about $6 billion um, by 2024. Um, we just saw a projection from MarketWatch saying that RTDs will reach about $32 billion in sales by the end of 2024. Huge growth in this segment. Um, so as Mark was saying, that is really appealing for people to get into the market. And that's drawing some of the big boys. So does anybody have any recommendations for craft distilleries, whether they should get into the market now or maybe wait a little longer to see what's panning out? Uh, my suggestion is get into it now. If you have the means and it makes business sense for you, I think the longer you wait, the more difficult it's going to be. Uh, but you have to really understand the, the implications, especially as Mark laid out in terms of capital, skill, space, and most importantly, from our experience, sales and distribution. You can't make, you know, a handful of cans in any way and, you know, get into that business and survive. It, it's, a, it's a big volume play and you have to have not only the capacity to produce it, but also the means to distribute it and sell it. And it's very much like the beer business. If you can't get to a certain scale, don't bother because the, um, the implications could be severe. I mean, this could be, you know, the thing that drives you out of business. But if you can, if you have the means, if, if you have the ability to sell and distribute, by all means, get into it sooner than later because it's going to get very difficult very quickly. So there's obviously a lot of craft uh, producers in the market, but there's also the, the bigger producers, uh, D Jack Daniels, Seagram's, uh, Absolute, Bacardi, a lot of the big players are in there that have the ability to, to do that scale. Um, are there any tips for how craft distilleries take some of the magic they have for their spirits and put that in a can to compete in RTD space? I think one of the advantages that smaller distilleries may have is that they have a tasting room and that they have a following and it's a good place just like with your bottled liquor. It's a really good place for R&D and testing your products. You know, we had a, we had a tasting room with uh, 12, 12 draft cocktails on that uh, rotated through from time to time. And that was the place where we tested the products and made the decision on which three we were going to put in cans first. Um, we have the ability as small producers to market test things in a way that the, the larger producers can't. The, the expense for them to do something like that would be enormous. So that, that's one potential advantage. But to Melkin's earlier point, if you can't do that and then produce something at a reasonable cost and at a relatively large volume in a short period of time, uh, you know, the, the RTD business is just not as forgiving. I would follow up with that. One, the craft producers have, you know, by nature, by our nature, a dedication to quality. And it's something that the uh, larger producers really can't duplicate. You know, if you're making uh, essentially a line extension of your, you know, some brand, vodka, rum, gin, you can't replicate very easily the experience that craft producers can, can, you know, can put out because we use better ingredients, we actually care about the quality. And there are actual makers at almost all of our companies producing the spirits and the RTDs. Uh, for the larger companies, you know, you have machine operators putting, you know, synthesized flavors into, you know, tanks, adding some alcohol and hitting the, the, the canning button. And the experience that this produces for the drinkers is not highly desirable. Yes, if you hand that, you know, cheap bottle of liquor to a bartender and he or she spends a little bit of time mixing five other ingredients, they can make a delicious drink but most likely not in the format of a canned cocktail. And because of the taxes that uh, Mark alluded to earlier, you know, these can't come down too much in price because state taxes 
force the price points to be, you know, at a minimum ten dollars a four pack. And if you're in the public and you have the choice of drinking something delicious for fifteen dollars versus something not remotely interesting for twelve dollars, you're going to spend that extra money getting something that will allow our peers to get into the space. Because as we've seen from actual cocktails at the bar, you know, someone would rather spend fifteen dollars on a drink rather than twelve dollars if that drink is delicious. Same thing is going to happen with canned cocktails. At least that's from our experience. Every time we've talked to a retailer, their biggest complaint is, I went all in on this brand and it didn't sell through after the initial trials. Well, guess what? Because the public didn't want to drink it. Yeah, it looked pretty. You put it on sale. You somehow enticed the, the first trial. But people know what a good drink is because we've been drinking it for a long time. And if that cocktail somehow falls short of that, I'm not buying it again. There are too many options, and my palate has evolved uh, to the point where I just won't put up with it, especially at the prices that state taxes force these products to sell at. Sure, if it was $6 a four pack, I might tolerate it, but it's not. It's 10, 12, 15, 17, or, or 20 a four pack. And at those prices, you better deliver that quality people want. And I think the craft industry has the ability an opportunity if they have the means to actually capture that you know that piece of the business versus a lot of the bigger companies even though they have distribution even though they have the muscle we have the quality we have the juice and we have the opportunity and you know weird way the obligation to step up and deliver what the public wants sounds like the same reasons why people would buy craft spirits for the quality um erica you mentioned that a lot of the, the consumers you're going for are people who might normally go out and have a beer um, in an outdoor activity. Uh, when people go buy a beer, they know that um, when they grab a can, that any brand's gonna be within a fairly nar narrow uh, range of how much alcohol's in it. But with an RTD, I'm seeing everything from about 5% ABV to 18 and even 19% ABV. Do you think there's a sweet spot for alcohol by volume? And if so, what, what sounds good in a can? Yeah, we went for more of that sessionable, um, you know, ABV. So with our vodka soda, uh, it's 5%. And we've even heard some people <laughs> say that that's too low, that they crack open the can, take a few sips and add some more. 5% <laughs> seems right uh, for us on that. And then with the Bramble Mule and the Maui Mule, um, you know, that's 6.5%. But I think it also depends what's the, what spirit is inside, you know, with a whiskey or a bourbon canned cocktail, people might expect it to be boozier. And then I think you can kind of play with that a little bit. But with the Moscow Mule, that's, you know, that's a refreshing drink that you might have one or two of. And so you want to keep that on the lower side, I think. Got it. And Mark, I know that Uncle Billy's had a fairly high ABV in their RTDs. Any thoughts on what's a sweet spot? No, not really. I mean, you say fairly high. We we were at 7%, you know, across all three. And uh, the interesting thing is I think some people felt like that might be a little bit low and some people felt like it was a little too high. And I think it really just kind of depends on, on the individual and the time and the place. One thing that we did see that I think is important in deciding that ABV is that uh, we were originally serving these out of the tasting room on a draft system um, from the draft into a, a, a glass with ice. And so what we didn't realize until after the fact is that most people were taking the cans and drinking straight from the can. They weren't getting the, uh, the dilution that they were getting across the bar and it made a difference in, in the taste and, and obviously the ABV of what they were finally drinking. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind as you're, you're making your decisions. So we saw um, some of the, the uh, recipes that you guys were sharing were sort of on the spritz side, and there's been a lot of those sort of seltzer-like RTDs, and then there's some more full-throttled um, classic cocktails. What do you see as the consumer interest between those sort of better-for-you spritzers and the classic cocktails? And is there a crossover in interest in those? Or from our point of view, the, um, the, the, the seltzer waters, the, you know, the, the white claws, trudies, uh, really are the light beers of the category. I mean, if you jumble everything together, they're kind of like that. They're low in alcohol, low in flavor. They're, uh, 
kind of forgettable in a lot of ways. And they're very similar in flavor profile, you know, similar to a light beer, for example. You know, if you have Michelob light versus Bud light, there's not a world of difference. Yeah, you might notice a little, you know, differences, but it's not, you know, it's not the same as, uh, you know, big hoppy IPAs in the vernacular of the beer. Um, the, the spirits-based cocktails, whether they're classic cocktails or uh, even the, the highball cocktails, they're the same thing. They're the craft beer of the, uh, the beer world, or, or the craft beer equivalent of the beer world, where there's density, there's complexity, there's, you know, an ability to have uh, real points of difference where one might appeal to one type of drinker versus another to another type. So whereas, uh, you know, the, the seltzers have homogeneity and the ability not to offend anyone, we in the cocktail world, uh, spirits-based cocktail world, have an ability to appeal to uh, distinct palates and have the ability to become someone's favorite drink because they're different, they're interesting, they're, they have a personality and they have the ability to make an impact uh, and make an occasion that, you know, the seltzers don't. Got it. Okay, so classic versus creative. Do you go for the tried and true classic cocktail recipes that people know or new, fun, and inventive recipes that might catch people's eyes? I think that there's room for both, for sure, and everything in, in between. I think there's even room for, you know, more of those seltzers. But, uh, you know, for us, uh, you know, the, the having the riff on the Moscow Mule was nice because it was familiar to people. People have sort of a baseline understanding of what a Moscow Mule is, um, but by adding our own twist, it made it different. You know, there's really nothing else like it um, on the market. Got it. And we talked a little bit about using real food, real flavors, um, real ingredients in the, in the canned cocktails. Um, Mark talked about some of the downside of that if you don't pasteurize or ensure absolute food science and cleanliness. Um, there are several companies out there making flavorings with real ingredients. Is there any advantage to taking a look at that for a startup or a, a growing um, RDD company? My suggestion, my strong suggestion would be to run away as fast as possible from those because that's going to be your death trap. Uh, flavors that you buy from you know, a flavor house are going to be uh, not distinct, uh, taste cheap, taste artificial. Uh, we've tried, I mean, we keep trying a dozen new RTDs every week if we can help it. And literally every single one that comes from a co-packer tastes bad, tastes artificial, tastes, you know, not remotely like what people want, which is that experience of having gone to a bar and having, you know, had a cocktail made, made for them by a bartender. So that's for us the real threshold. If your RTDs from some magical flavor house can taste like a real drink, like a, an actual real drink, then go for it. We have yet to run across a company that produces flavor that can remotely match that just because that's not part of their MO. They're into making simplistic things that they can sell for very low amount of money. And uh, a lot of people can use them to produce inexpensive things, which is not what this is about from our point of view. This is a treat. You know, this is not food. We don't have to drink. We want to drink delicious things. And if your RTDs are you know, coming from a flavor house, you're dead in the water unless you can charge next to nothing for them. But because of taxes, you can't charge next to nothing and you offer very little value to the public. Yes, they'll try it once uh, because of some promotion or because you have a pretty package. But guess what? The minute they try something else, like, you know, something better, they're dumping your, you know, flavor-based uh, product uh, like yesterday's news because it can't compete and it never has been able to compete. The only reason people have been able to, companies have been able to get away with that is because they charge very little for them. But that pricing you know, differential doesn't exist in canned cocktails. So, you know, for at least our peer companies, I would say, you know, run away from that as fast as possible because it will destroy your ability to compete and may destroy your company. I would agree with that. I think um, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. And there are so few places that a small company can compete with the larger companies. Um, one thing that you can do that they can't is use real flavors, real ingredients, and um, um, real food. And 
it's just too expensive for them to do it. It's going to be more expensive for you as well. And the key, of course, and Erica talked a lot about this, is how you tell your story and how you differentiate yourself from the, the products out there that are using those other types of, of ingredients. Okay, so we've been talking all about cans. Um, I've been seeing lately, though, there's been a lot of 750 milliliter bottles coming on the market um, with things like old fashions or other cocktails that are ready to pour over ice uh, rather than being consumed um, straight out of a can. Do you guys have any thoughts on whether that's a good idea to do um, different types of packaging with cans and bottles? We entered the can world instead of the bottle world because we thought the, uh, the, the accessibility of cans would allow us to make a much quicker, much broader appeal to the public because of, you know, uh, less work, price points, and the ABV. You know, there are a lot of, uh, there have been a lot of bottle RTDs for a very long time, you know, going back 10 years or, or, even, or even earlier, which just didn't sell all that well. Uh, there were more recent stabs at it with um, um, kind of lower ABV, like uh, Palomas, Margaritas, uh, uh, Daiquiris, which involved fresh juice or something that kind of was like fresh juice. But those, because the juice is not stable, didn't do all that well either and had to be priced very low. Um, so, I mean, from our experience, our RTDs as cans are a lot more easy for you know the public to get their you know heads around and their hands around versus uh, Negronis, Boulevardiers, Old Fashions, and those kinds of boozier drinks, which are much harder to consume, uh, quite a bit of, and in the past haven't proven themselves. Now it might open up after everyone experiences canned cocktails and they're thinking. Well, if I don't have to make my Moscow Mule or my Spritz or my, you know, uh, rum and cola at home, maybe I don't have to make my Negroni either. Maybe I can just find one of these things, and instead of buying three bottles, I can just buy one and keep drinking it. But, you know, we, we will actually, we will enter that later rather than sooner because the, the lower, lower alcohol, the canned cocktails are a lot more accessible to a lot more people. Yeah, I think to Melkin's point with a 750 glass bottle, you know, portability is, is, um, could be a challenge. You know, you're not necessarily going to mm -hmm. pack that in your cooler for the beach or take it with you on a boat or something like that. Um, but it does look pretty. Uh, it's a nice presentation, a nice gift, something like that. But I think cans are where it's at right now. Well, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate your, your time, Mark, Melkin, and, and Erica, uh, for joining us for Bar Convent's Global Bar Week. This was a great conversation about ready. Video. Uh, you can find more videos from us during Global Bar Week, or you can visit parkstreetuniversity.com and see our entire collection. Thanks.